Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today we are going to be talking about two Web of Venom one-shots, one of which, or both of which actually I missed when they came out. Uh, the Wraith one I wasn't super interested in, to be honest with you, uh, when it first was announced. But the Web of Venom Good Sun one I was because it dealt with the aftermath of Absolute Carnage and it talks about Normie Osborne and, uh, and obviously Dylan and it's a story focused on them with Sleeper in it. And, uh, and I remember it was coming up and I was excited for it. And then when it came out, I was kind of deflated so much from Absolute Carnage that I didn't read it. And then when I read Venom Island Part 1, I was like, wait, why is Dylan mad at Eddie? Like, what's going on here? And a lot of you guys said, oh, it's probably because some of the, the setup that was in Good Son where, where, you know, he feels a little abandoned by Eddie leaving and just leaving a note behind. And I said, yeah, I guess that makes a little bit of sense. Not a ton of sense because they bonded so well at the end of Absolute Carnage. It still felt like a complete 180, but I was like, well, let me give it a chance and, you know, I'll look up that book one day and read it. So recently Marvel had a sale on Comixology where you could buy one book, get one free. So I bought Good Son and I got uh, you know, Wraith for free uh, because they were the same price. They were both $4.99, which is just ridiculous, <laughs> but uh, but they were $4.99. So I, I, pay, I paid $2.50 for each of them basically because one was free. So that to me made it worth it. Um, so yeah, this book is actually written by Zach Thompson, uh, not by the first one called The Good Son, Web of Venom, The Good Son, is written by Zach Thompson, and the art is by Dio Nevez. I think that's how you say uh, Dio's last name, um, so hopefully I'm not butchering that. And Oren Jr. is the inker on this book. Uh, the book looks fine. Um, I think my biggest issue with this comic, The Good Son, is the dialogue. Uh, I talked about it a little bit in my Flash Thompson episode that we did recently, The Circle of Four where a lot of writers nowadays, I feel like they grew up with reading that bad Bendis dialogue and thinking it was really good. and Or maybe they just have the genuine opinion that they do like it and like that style. And so this wasn't an extreme like like replica of Bendis' style, but the dialogue was about on the level of a Bendis dialogue in, in, a, in a bad way, like on Bendis' worst book. Um, that's how I felt about this. Like not to slam Zach Thompson too much. I don't know much about Zach's work outside of this. I'm, I'm sure I've probably talked about a book or two that he's written before, but I just don't remember, um, you know, Zach specifically. But this book just, I was so interested going like, oh, I'm finally going to get that missing piece after Absolute Carnage and into Venom Island. And I'm also going to read a story about Dylan and Normie, who I thought were some of my best, my, my favorite parts of uh, Absolute Carnage was the main Venom book that tied into Absolute Carnage, where it was them two with Sleeper dealing with um, the evil Reed Richards, you know, and uh, the maker. And I thought that stuff was my favorite out of Absolute Carnage, uh, you know. So I was kind of pumped to re read a story about these two characters. And I really didn't like it. Like in the beginning, the first bit of dialogue between the two kids, I can't tell if they're, if they're, arguing with each other if they're trying to one-up each other of like who's got the worst dad or, or family life you know it's like it, it felt really weird it felt like a almost like two sociopaths talking and I'm sure that wasn't the goal of of what Zach was trying to to write but it just came across that way it was just like these empty comments uh, and then empty responses to the comments and it felt really I don't know it was very jarring so it took me a minute to get into this book. What I liked about this book, though, is that uh, every couple pages, when um, you know uh, Dylan was saying, "Oh, I have this ability where I can, I have this like sliver of the symbiote from uh, from your dad, like when he was Carnage, um, and then you know then it got absorbed into the big Carnage at the end of Absolute Carnage, he has still a sliver of it, and he's like, "Yeah, I can protect it and I can shield it." And I can make people see it when I want them to see it. So he's been playing with it the whole time in plain sight. But apparently Dylan's powers, he's able to like prevent people from seeing what's in his hand, I guess, when he's playing with it. So they don't know that he's holding a piece of the Carnage symbiote, which I'm like, God, how much more powerful can this kid get? And how convenient that he only uses these powers when the story needs him to. And then he doesn't at other times, which is, it's so silly. Um, Dylan is definitely one of those characters. Where he's a Mary Sue, in my opinion. Um, he has struggles for sure, but they're, they're, they're not, to me, they're not real struggles. Like, they were when he first got introduced, when he found out he was a victim of child abuse. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, like, uh, him having this, like, you know, or it doesn't make sense, but I should say, like, it, it added something to the character where it was like, okay, I feel bad for this guy, especially someone myself who went through something like that as a kid. It was like, okay, I, like, I, I'm connecting with this kid, but now that he just has the power to do everything whenever he wants, I'm kind of like, I'm losing my connection to caring about Dylan, and this book is pushing me further away from the character of Dylan. Because when I was reading this, it was like, all right, so he's 
preventing Sleeper, even, another symbiote, from seeing him holding the Carnage sliver. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, so, you know, and Dylan says, well, my dad keeps, has kept secrets from me. He, he, you know, recently revealed he was my actual dad. So, you know, I guess he's keeping secrets from me. So I'm going to keep a secret from him now. And you're just like, okay. Like, again, it, I feel like everyone's just angsty towards each other just because the story needs a little bit of drama and nothing feels really earned or, you know, or, or um, I guess flu. It doesn't flow well. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel organic is the word I'm looking for. So... Dylan, uh, at one point in the storyline, uh, you have Normie coming up to him and saying, like, okay, well, you have a secret with your symbiote. Let me show you something that my dad is still obsessed with. And he brings him into a room. He steals his dad's key card, or, or Dylan does, I think. And Normie brings uh, you know, Dylan into a room. They open it up, and there's goblin gear. And he's like, see, even though my dad is a wimp now and normal, and he's not, like, you know, a supervillain or anything like that anymore, he still thinks about the goblin all the time because he has a secret room with goblin stuff in it. And I was like, that's interesting, especially when you know what's going on in the current Nick Spencer stuff. It uh, it makes a, it makes it more interesting. We'll talk about that coming up because I finally read um, the reveal of Kindred issue, and the, and they have some things in there that tie into the Osborns and the family and everything like that. And so I'll get into that. We'll make a video on that coming up soon. Uh, and then we'll also do Ravencroft coming up soon too. That whole series, I think we're going to do that coming up in a few episodes. So um, and that deals with Norman Osborn as well. So, uh, so I was like, okay, there's, you know, I, I was intrigued. I like, I liked actually that moment when uh, Normie says, "See, my dad is even still obsessed. My dad is obsessed with goblins. Your dad is obsessed with symbiotes. We actually are a lot alike." And I'm like, okay, I, that's okay. I like that. That was kind of neat. But then they decide to. Um, one of the things I said I liked earlier about Sleeper, every couple pages, Sleeper, like you, uh, Dylan says that Sleeper can't see what he's really doing, but then you see Sleeper in the background as the cat you know, watching Dylan and, and Normie just go about doing their thing. And so you're like, oh, Sleeper does know. So I, I thought that was kind of clever. Like they don't come out and say it until later in the story, but I like those little references where every once in a while you'll see a panel and just out of frame, you'll see the cat staring at Dylan and Normie. And I'm like, that's pretty good. So I don't know if that was a note from Zach to the artist or if Dio did that because he knew where the story was going to go. But either way, it was a great idea. Or maybe the editor suggested it. I don't know. Whoever's idea it was, it was neat to see Sleeper pop up. Because Sleeper, I actually really like. Sleeper is a remnant from the Mike Costa run, uh, at the end of Mike Costa's run from uh, First Host. And I like Sleeper. I think he's a, I, at first I was like, oh, another symbiote child. But Sleeper's actually neat. He's got unique powers. And I like that about him. So um, so anyway, so uh, Dylan and Normie, they put on some masks, uh, masks and they go out at night. And they decide to use the Carnage symbiote, bond it with like a random raccoon in the, you know, in like Central Park or something. And then they go around uh, controlling it, getting it to do things so that they can like, you know, steal or just do juvenile stuff. And I'm like, eh, I mean, it's, I get what Zach was going for here, you know, where it's like, oh, let's have these kids sneak out of their house and, and you know, and go have some fun, you know, like kids will sometimes do. I kind of get that and let's amplify it because they're, you know, like one of them has powers and, and you know, Normie is you know, was depowered recently because he was the goblin child and he had the suit extracted from him and the codex extracted from his spine, apparently. So uh, so he doesn't really have anything left uh, to be spe to make him special, but yet uh, he's still trying to keep up with Dylan and he, he does pretty good through this issue. But um, yeah, so as he sees Dylan like tapping more into the, the powers that Null is offering him, it's starting to scare uh, in Normie a little bit more. And so, uh, so Normie, who was like, starts off this book more confident by the end, he's feeling a lot less confident. And at the beginning he liked having his, this friend. And then by the end of the book, he's liking having the friend less. And I thought that was kind of neat. And I think even Molten Man shows up. I think uh, Uncle Mark, I think that's Molten Man. Um, but there's a, you know, some guy named Mark shows up and he has powers to like melt things. Cause he mentions he melts the window at one point. Um, but, uh, when Normie calls Dylan crazy, Dylan doesn't like that. He's like, I'm not crazy. And he like puts the carnage symbiote onto his fist and he goes to attack and, uh, they get knocked out the window. Um, and there's a big smash, like the window smashes and they fall out the window and sleeper who has been paying attention this whole time jumps out and saves the two boys and puts them in line and says, Hey, what are you doing? I've been watching this whole time. Is that what you've been keeping? That secret of the symbiote? You got to tell Eddie. And he basically, you know, Sleeper talks Dylan back to normalcy and says, you got to tell your dad. And he says, he's like, don't keep secrets. That's what was tearing your relationship apart from your father was secret. So don't be like your dad. 
be honest with him. When he comes back from wherever he is, tell him about the symbiote uh, sliver that you have. And he said, okay, I will. So they have that conversation. And then they're like, wait, we got to get you back upstairs because, you know, Mark is going to be coming into the room. He's babysitting you guys while your parent, you know, while uh, Normie's parents are out on date night or something. He's like, so he's going to be coming up to your room. I, you know, I heard him waking up when the window smashed. So I got to get you guys back in that room before he gets there. So he does. Sleeper gets him in the room and they just pretend like they're playing baseball. And they're like, I'm sorry. We accidentally smashed the window. I hit the baseball. And, you know, um, Mark was like, yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll just melt the window down and shut it. And uh, and we'll, we'll deal with it. We'll tell your parents in the morning. No harm, no foul. And then as, you know, Dylan's going to sleep, Nola's, ta you know, reaching out to him and, and saying like, you know, the others are weak you're special you're more powerful than them uh don't have weak friends like normie here and like your father like they're all weak you are the key you know you're gonna you're gonna be something and you're gonna be powerful and and all that stuff so basically he's like trying to manipulate dylan because like we've said before i feel like what's going to happen is there's going to be that big emotional moment in you know king and black or something is going to be whether dylan sides with uh, you know, Null, or if he sides with Eddie, and I think that's going to be the big, the big decision there, um, or, or at least one of the big decisions in that story. And whether which side he chooses, I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I certainly can't predict a lot of things, and I may even be wrong about this prediction. But I just feel like it makes sense. That's the trajectory they're going on. Is Dylan going to be the good son or the bad son? Is he going to side with his father, or is he going to side with, um, you know, with Null here? So, uh, so I don't know. We'll see. But then there's also another Zach Thompson story in the back. I think uh, Juan G uh, Gideon does the artwork to it. It's a little short story with Sleeper uh, being out in space. So during the time after First Host, when he was out in space before he came back to Earth, they tell that story where he actually fights some aliens, goes to Clintar, and uh, you know, and then sees Noel awaken, and he's like, "Crap, you know, like I gotta, like you know, Noel's gonna be getting up soon. I gotta get back to Earth and, and warn everybody." And that's what brings him obviously back to Earth, and that's why he's hanging out with Dylan as a cat, so he can kind of keep an eye on Dylan because I'm guessing he knows that Noel has plans for Dylan. So they have that little short story at the back, which I thought was cool because there were times when the symbiote would melt off, and you would see the Cree member that was, you know, that he was like bonded to. You could see his skull underneath, so he's still like a dead body that uh, that the symbiote is bonded to. So this symbiote, that's what I like about Sleeper. He's a little different. He's bonded to a corpse, a rotted corpse at that, as opposed to an actual living being, which I think is just neat and different. So there was some good stuff in Good Son, and there was some stuff that I just felt like was kind of bland. Mostly the dialogue was just really mad to me. I didn't. I really just didn't like the dialogue. But I thought overall it was fine. Like I, I get what they were going for, but it still didn't help me understand Venom Island Part One anymore. Like when Dylan just straight up dislikes Eddie, I, it's like I still don't feel that. I feel like that was forced because the way they ended Absolute Carnage, where they were holding each other, and it was like okay. And then the very next issue, it was like I hate you, Eddie. And it's like okay, like it just it felt like too much of a one eighty. I know sometimes kids can flip-flop and you know be emotional and so can adults but it just felt like a little too much to me um but anyway the last thing i want to talk about is wraith i don't have a lot to say about this one although i'm sure i'll still talk for 10 minutes about it but web of venom wraith this is written by donny cates and it's a, a i don't know how to pronounce your first name i think it's guyu villanova uh g villanova i'll just go with g villanova um, so I'm sorry if I'm butchering your art. I mean, butchering your name, not your art. Your art's fantastic. Uh, cause that's one of the things I got to say about this issue here. I noticed was the art was actually really good. Um, I like this big splash page, uh, of Wraith standing there at the beginning, tearing down these, you know, alien creatures and trying to go back to his, his home world and, uh, you know, which he hasn't been back to for a long time. And he talks about how in the Guardians of the Galaxy run that Donny Cates uh, wrote that Wraith showed up in it to capture Gamora. So they mentioned that in here. So there was, you know, it's, it's clear Donny Cates, like I said, he's an idea guy. And he will plant seeds and, and try to pay them off in other stories. I feel like he's really good at planting the seeds. And then he's really bad at paying them off and turning them into trees. Uh, that's how I feel about a lot of Donny's ideas. Not every odd Donny idea. I think a lot of times... He'll plant seeds and, and they actually are really, they come out and I'm like, oh, that's worked out great. But I think a lot of times he just kind of was like, all right, I plant that idea. I got to, let's wrap that up. Let's get that over with. And this Wraith thing feels like that. It's like Wraith uh, comes across, you know, goes back to his home planet, starts learning this language. And he's reaching out to his father, like uh, spiritually in a way. And he's like, you know, dad, you were working on something. You were looking for this being of light or this power of light. Um, and this is when this, whole thing started to really come into focus for me because I remember being on 
like Thinking Critical and other shows, uh, like, you know, mainly Thinking Critical, um, and then also in my own shows, and I was comparing Donny Cates' uh, Venom run to Jeff Johns' Green Lantern run. And I was saying, oh, from a pacing standpoint, it feels very similar. You have the rebirth storyline, or, or in Venom's case, you have Rex, which kind of reestablishes the main character as you know the 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 host of Venom, and then reestablishes how Jordan as the host of, of being Green Lantern again. Um, and then it sets up Null in the Venom story, and this sets up Necron and Blackest Night um, and Black Hand in this story. And then you go into like the story where, okay, remember that past thing that happened? Well, it didn't happen the way you thought it was. So in Green Lantern's case, it was uh, Revenge of the Green Lanterns, I think it was called, or Search for the Green Lanterns, where there was a bunch of Green Lanterns Hal thought he killed, but it turns out his memories weren't exactly the way he uh, were weren't exactly true, I guess, and those a lot of those Green Lanterns were still alive. So he goes and saves them in hopes that it'll redeem him with in the eyes of the other Green Lantern Corps. And Venom here, he has a bunch of memories erased from him by the symbiote. And he finds out he has a son and that, you know, and he like his past comes back to haunt him in that way. And then he has to move forward from there. So not exact stories, but similar where it dealt with, all right, your memory wasn't what it was. And this one's your memory. So and then you get into um, Sinestro Core War after that. And Sinestro Core War was Green Lantern versus his arch enemy, you know, Sinestro. And they there was, you know, Sinestro built his own core, his own army. Carnage is Venom's antithesis. And he builds his own Carnage army to battle, you know, Venom and everyone in New York and stuff and try to take over. Um, so it was just kind of funny. Like, it's just like this, these parallels. So then I started thinking, I'm like, well, what other parallels are there? Are they going to do like Blackest Night? Like, is King in Black going to be Blackest Night? Uh, where, you know, um, you find out ne uh, Null can resurrect the dead, which we already kind of seen with Grendel's mother and stuff. So you kind of have that ability already there, probably. Uh, but then you also have, uh, uh, you know, like... Um, References, I think they're leading up to Blackest Night, there was even a comic book about Santa Claus and Larfleas. And in King and Black, you're going to have an Iron Man Doctor Doom book that deals with Santa Claus. So I was just like, God, these parallels are so crazy. So I'm like, are we going to get a white lantern like we did in Blackest Night? Is there going to be an anti-Null that shows up to help the characters fight Null? And is Eddie going to be the host of the anti-Null to fight Null? And then I read this and I was like, and I even said that. I go, oh, I bet you they'll do some kind of Blackest Night thing. And I said that on Thinking Critical's show. And then I see, I read this and I go, you got to be kidding me. Like they're, they they actually set up an anti-null right here when he's talking about, oh, my father was looking into this like, uh, you know, white power energy, this light that uh, battled the darkness. And uh, and he starts learning about his, a little bit more from his father and what happened to him and what happened to their race and everything. So he takes this knowledge. He sees the spiral written along with all these other kind of paintings and writings and he goes to Clintar, and uh, he calls it the Planet of Symbiotes, a.k.a. the Cage of Null. So apparently he has learned now that Null is being caged there. And he goes down to the surface, walks on the, the, the desert surface of the planet, um, which in some comics it was portrayed as a desert before, and sometimes it wasn't. But as he's there, the planet explodes and Null awakens. So this is the moment when Null awakens. So I'm kind of surprised Wraith didn't pass sleeper on the way but at the same time sleeper probably left way before wraith gets there because wraith gets there right as the planet blows up so uh so anyway wraith sees null and the first person that null deals with when he awakens is wraith and he sees wraith and he's asking him these things and he's like you know i don't know where and when i am which is also a little weird because hasn't he been influencing the grendel and other like and contacting eddie and and dylan like so I'm, I'm kind of confused, like why he would say, oh, I don't really know where I am or, or you got to refresh my memory. He's like, who are you? And he's like, I'm, I'm this. And he's like, I'm Wraith. And he's like, I don't know what that is. And he's like, and he goes, oh, wait, I recognize you now because Wraith says the name of his his alien race. So Noel goes, oh, he goes, oh, OK, he goes, I think I know what that is. So he rips Wraith's costume off and you find out it's kind of symbiote like. And he uses it to absorb into his like sword, his like giant symbiote sword, um, and so and so he leaves uh, Wraith kind of naked and pale white and just kind of floating in the abyss. And then he like uh, throws him out into space, like you know, Wraith is like, "Don't turn your back on me. I'm gonna avenge my father and I'm gonna avenge my race and you know, what your influence has done to us." And Noel goes, "I didn't create you, man. Like you're just trash." This was probably the most interesting thing I've heard Null say the entire time, and he and it was an accident. Like he didn't even do it. Uh, so, so again, I'm not a fan of this Null character. Everyone goes Gaga over him, 
but he hasn't done jack shit to me to prove that he's a worth a worthy villain of anybody uh he just they, they just say he's all powerful and he killed a celestial like he was just given all this stuff by donny cates he wasn't he didn't earn anything and then in the silver surfer black story he didn't earn any of that either so it just like to me null is just the biggest non-character ever which is why I'm hoping King and Black turns me around on that and turns pe other people who think like that, who share that opinion that I have. I hope that turns us around because to me, that's your last chance. If, if, if Noel is still not a fully fleshed out, interesting character after King and Black, then what's the point of even having him around anymore, in my opinion? So, um, so yeah. So anyway, so you have Noel is, you know, he's like, don't turn your back on me, Wraith says, you know, and then Noel does. And then he, when Wraith goes up to attack him, Wraith kicks him, or Wraith gets kicked, I mean, by Noel, and Noel kicks Wraith out into space, out into the abyss, and then Noel turns, he sees all the symbiotes that were once caged him, and he turns them all into Grendels, I guess, and that's what he's going to lead an army with to Earth, and he goes off and flies towards Earth and where he's going to go, leaving uh, Wraith out, just floating in through space, naked, and just, you know, without his costume and stuff, and I thought that was kind of neat, I'm like, alright, that was a quick battle, and uh, and, you know, but where is it going to go from here? And then it was just like, again, nothing earned, nothing really, anything. It was like Wraith, this white light shows up and touches Wraith. And it has like these symbols. It's like a circle with like these little tiny circles around it. And that's when, you know, Wraith looks at it and says, oh, wait, you're the light that my father was looking for. He's like, you're that. You're the being. You're the antithesis of Null. And he goes, you're a, a god of light. And, and whereas Null is the god of darkness. And I'm like, that's exactly what happened in Blackest Night, like for the most part. Like the White Lantern, they never really categorized what the White Lantern being was, but it was definitely the antithesis of Necron's, you know, uh, energy of darkness or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just kind of like, oh man. Um, so then you cut back to New York and the book ends with Eddie walking with Dylan and they're getting like a hot dog. Um, and I thought that was kind of neat because like I said, I think Donnie does that stuff pretty well. So they're arguing whether they should put uh, ketchup on the hot dog or not. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but then this being of light shows up and it's Wraith. He teleports himself to Earth with the last of his power, conveniently. And he shows up and Eddie turns into Venom and says, stand back, Dylan, I got this. And he goes up and that's when Wraith looks at him and goes, are you Eddie Brock? He goes, yeah, how do you know who I am? He goes, he goes to touch him. You know, like Wraith goes to touch Eddie, but he starts to fade away and his hand goes right through Eddie's hand. And he's like, look, I don't have a lot of time. Like, um, I'm going to be, I'm dying essentially. He's like, but uh, there's there's someone coming after you. And Eddie's like, I know, Noel is. Like, you know, you didn't have to come all this way to tell me. And he goes, no, not Noel. Um, he said, uh, there's a god of light that's coming for you. And Eddie's kind of like, okay. <laughs> and then the book ends there and says, to be continued and in the ground where Wraith was standing is the circle symbol with the, the six circles around it. Those are, that's like etched and burned into the ground and there's like smoke coming out of it. So yeah, this book was just kind of, you know, the meth, the, uh, the meh, uh, the Wraith book was mad to me. Uh, I didn't really dig it that much. Um, I thought there was a couple interesting ideas in it and concepts and some things that harken back to like older stories with Wraith. I mean, I'm not an expert on Wraith. I'm not going to sit here and say I know his whole history. So maybe the stuff with the, his dad and the light, because I don't know if that was mentioned in Annihilation or Annihilation Conquest, because I read those when they came out, but I haven't reread them in a long time. So it's possible that that could just be existing lore that Donnie's building off of. But I just find it still kind of like, God, I hope it's not like Eddie Brock and the heroes losing and they're losing. And then all of a sudden, boom, this white lantern being shows up, inhabits Eddie. Eddie kills Noel with it or whatever. Like, I just I just hope it's not that. Like, I want, I like when people earn things and heroes earn things. And I, I'd like to see Eddie, being the underdog that he is, find a way to win. Like, I mean, like, that's that's Eddie's greatest superpower in a lot of ways is that that perseverance that stubbornness really it's not even it's willpower but it's stubbornness I think more than willpower power he's like the opposite of a green lantern he's like just stubborn and uh, and he he won't go down without a fight and I, I would like to see him come up with a creative way to fight and battle Noel as opposed to just simple punches you know like oh let's just beat him to death with all the superheroes like that's probably not going to work their, their big foolproof plan they have um, and then also I don't want some MacGuffin to show up and I, and I, same with Dylan. Like, I don't want Dylan to just be able to snap his fingers and, and wipe out Null. Like, that's what I'm, I'm just afraid of things like that happening. Um, or maybe, maybe Dylan does want to side with Null and then, and it feels a connection to him. And then maybe something's revealed about Dylan 
and it's it's pulling him away from Eddie, and Eddie's like, no, I gotta save my son. He says yes to the white energy, kills Null with it, and then Dylan says no, and then he snaps his fingers and kills the white energy. You know, like maybe that's what happens, and then Eddie's left, you know, changed after that, after being touched by a god of light, but then having it wiped away, like maybe that, and then Dylan's like an enemy from now on, like, I don't know, that could be the, the story they go with, but either way, like, I just felt like this setup just felt like so last minute, like, at the very last minute, we're going to cram in this idea and set up for a White Lantern type uh, character, and I'm like, well, that was one of my critiques of Jeff's run that I didn't like, was that it, the White Lantern thing wasn't fully set up, it was just kind of, like, put in there towards the end when the story was, like, you know, wrapping up, and I kind of was like, although, and they had to spend a whole series called Brightest Day to explain the White Lantern, which that I did like, but it was just, you know, I... I in the story itself, I was just kind of like, oh, really? Just wait. Just, you just got White Lantern show up, and like it, that, it seemed like so simple. It seemed like a like a silly Power Rangers story almost. But um, in this one, I hope they do something different. I don't know. We'll see. But again, it just solidifies my feeling on that. It just makes me double down that Donny Cates is just pulling a lot of his stuff from the Jeff Johns run. <laughs> like that's how I feel. Like I said, even though Donny Cates isn't writing the Iron Man Doctor Doom Santa story, I think Cantwell is the guy who writes the Doctor Doom book currently. But still, that idea is happening in his King and Black story. And right before Blackest Night, that's when Larflees went to look for Santa or whatever, right after. It was around the time of Blackest Night. So to me, I just started laughing. I was like, man, the similarities are just down to Santa. <laughs> like, that's how similar these things are. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what King and Black brings. Uh, will I read King and Black? Yes. Uh, I will read the main book, and I'll read the Venom issues that tie into it, and that is it. Uh, I will not read any of the tie-in issues. Um, just the Venom like issues 31 and to whatever it's going to go to and then King and Black 1 through 5. I will read those and probably review those on the show but I will not uh, read any of the tie-ins. I, I learned my lesson from Absolute Carnage and there's so and there's also so many tie-ins here that it's ridiculous um, and we'll go over that. I, probably by the time this episode airs up online I'll probably have already done a live episode where I talk about King and Black. So that might already be up on Venom Vlog Live. So if you want to go watch that, um, if, if it is up already, I'll put the link down below. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to go over this book with you and I'll tell you, we will talk about King and Black. We're going to do a Road to King and Black where I'm going to, you know, on a live stream. Um, I haven't done it yet, but I might do it before this goes up. So in, in case you're watching them in that order, um, the live stream will be about us recapping what Eddie or what Eddie uh what Eddie has gone through so far written by Donny Cates we will recap that and then we will talk about all the um tie-ins and main comics that King and Black is going to affect um that we know of so far because right now it's uh you know October 20th so we only know what's coming up between now and January with King and Black so we'll talk about all of that in the live stream as well so if you haven't watched yet go check that out and that'll probably be the last I talk about King and Black until the book comes out <laughs> so so uh, but i will if you're looking forward to that i will buy the main book and the tie-ins of venom and we will review those on the channel uh, but everything outside of that i will not be reading i will wait till they come out on comiXology and wait till they're like a dollar a piece and then i'll buy them and review them at that time um so yeah and as echo comes in the room and shakes his head that is my sign to end the episode so thank you guys so much let me know what you thought of good son and wraith love to hear your thoughts down below and we'll continue our conversation down there as always Thanks for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.